Hey man, hope you're having a great day. Appreciate you sending this over. I'm excited to uh, go through this quickly here for you. Um, so first things first, I read through emails as a sales email. That's the way that I write. Now everybody has different ways that they write their emails. And depending on the parts of the world that you're in, if you're talking to people in Europe versus North America, the language that you talk is going to convert differently and it's going to do different things. So my experience is largely within marketing in the US and a bit in Europe, um, but mostly in the US. So what I'm going to focus on here for you um, is the ADA framework, which is a tried and true sales copywriting framework, which is um, attention, interest, desire, and action. And I'm going to break this down here. We're also going to talk about something called dual readership path, which I think will help you out here as well. Um, and just at a first glance, um, I redacted your name here because like, I'm hoping that you'll let me use this video to share with a few other people as well. Um, I think at a first glance, it's not a bad email, um, but it, there's, there's definitely some corners that could be rounded off and perhaps will improve your conversions. At the end of the day, I think it's worth saying that any advice I can give you, any advice anybody can give you, no matter the amount of money you pay them, um, Really, you don't know until you test it. Somebody else's audience, somebody else's timing, what they knew in that moment when they sent that email is different from where you're at sending that email. So here's an example. I had a campaign, sent like 115 emails out and I got 36% response rates back. They were almost all positive responses, like just crazy, like over 30 positive replies, right? Just totally crazy numbers. Um, and I was thrilled. I had almost an 80% or maybe over 80% open rate on the email. It did really well. So then I went to the exact same thing, the same strategy a little bit later, and it almost flopped. It just didn't really work that well. And I was kind of taken aback and I had to say, you know what, hey, there was something about this, the timing, the way it worked really well the first time. And I know that if I do this consistently, I might get a result like I did the first time. But at the end of the day, to go around and tell everybody, hey, here's a strategy that will bring you 80 five percent open rates and 36 percent reply rates is unrealistic and everybody flexes that but um the consistency is what that comes from because i've done several more campaigns and had other sub several more large successes but it's from that consistency um, so no more harping on theory let me dive in here and just get into it so First off, subject line, you checked our website. You told me this gets a 20 to 25% open rate. I don't usually settle for anything less than 40%. Um, I think it's cool that obviously you're doing that like reverse IP tracking or whatever it is to say that you checked our website, but I would think two things when I see that. My first thought is it's an automated email um, and it's probably spam. That's where my brain goes. Um, but I might be curious if I liked what I saw on the website, I might be like, hey, you know, maybe there's an offer in here, maybe there's a coupon I can get or something. And, and save a little bit of money. Um, so I would maybe I would maybe rephrase this. I would maybe try uh, something like saw you visited our website. Try that. You know what I mean? That's just a little bit warm. See if that gets a better result. Or you could say um, something specific to what they visited. So uh, can I tell you more about X from our website, you know, something like that uh, with a question. It could be converting as well. But again, you don't know until you test it. I would just say that don't settle for the 20%. 20% means you're on to something, but you haven't got to that something yet. Your, your needle on your compass is pointed north, but you need to travel further to get closer to that north star because you're not there yet. Uh, so with that said, let's move into the copy. Hi, Matt. That's great. Um, I don't worry too much unless it's certain industries. I might go a little more casual and just say, hey, Matt. Um, but typically, hi is formal and what works best. Uh, one of the biggest struggles with data management. Immediately, my brain goes, again, maybe I'm not your target audience. Um, but I'm like, eh, I feel like it's it's like a, a leading question, right? It doesn't really feel like it's of value to me. Uh, companies are grossly an influx of data and managing it. Managing it all is difficult. Um, that makes sense. Sorry, I had to pause the video and just change rooms here because there was some background noise coming in. Um, but here's what I would say. Uh, first things first, you know, what are the, what are the biggest struggles with data management? 
um, feels a bit like a leading question and that the work is on them to kind of sell themselves for you. Um, companies who grow seen influx of data and managing it all is difficult. It, I'll be totally blunt. My mind, like what went through my head and I was like, oh, don't say that, right? That's rude. But what went through my head was tell me something I don't already know, right? It's like, if I'm in this position, if this is a need I have, then I know this, right? Um, so it's not helping me. I'm actually losing time, probably getting frustrated in my inbox reading this. Um, with all these products to help, building an in-house program seems like an easier thing to do, but at what cost? It's a pretty broad assumption. And with what products to help? Um, you know, maybe if you've got the, a very specific title that deals with some products that they purchase all the time, uh, maybe that's totally, you know, they're going to get it right away. But I would say with all these products to help building an in-house program, I'd be like, you know, maybe I've never even thought of building an in-house program. So, you know, what does this guy really know about me? Um, <coughs> my company, you know, XYZ Corp is a data matching solution, has its roots in the early nineties. Let's say kind of a cool flex but it's still a flex over 2000 companies have benefited from the matching engine neat but it's still about you and i'm going to show you how to convert this to being about them because it's the content is close but it's not quite there it's all inward facing it's kind of going to tell them about me and it's kind of brochure material uh, time is an asset and that's the reason i'm reaching out to you is to save you more time well at this point it doesn't feel like it because i read a whole bunch of stuff i already knew and that i didn't really care about because at the end of the day i'm thinking about me right what's in it for me that's the question i'm i'm asking subconsciously as i read this email would you mind if i send a case if a case study or switch zoom it over to you at this point i'd say yeah i do mind. you know don't send me any more of this because <laughs> i don't know what what i'm supposed to get out of this right what's the value for me here you're telling me you're going to give me time but so far i haven't got anything in fact i've lost time reading this email so no don't send me a case study or data sheet that would be my instinctive response um so here's where i would change Let's start by changing your leading question to let's go into the ADA framework, right? So we're talking attention and really this is about attracting them. You want to draw them in. Um, so something somewhat personal. So what are the biggest struggles with data management? Again, I don't know your specific niche and I don't know who your specific audience is. Um, so I can take a stab at this, but you would probably know better off the top of your head a different way to intro this. I will say though, if you're going to ask a question, um, it, it should be specific and something that's leading towards building value for them. Um, and I don't see this as that. A leading question for context is something that kind of just uh, positions them to give you the answer that you want back as the person asking the question. And if you can see through that, which most people can, um, then it, it's kind of a leading question and it works against you. So companies who grow see an influx. This right here is an opportunity to talk about companies who grow. Let's not talk about companies who grow, right? The next part is, so let's say you personalized this a little bit. Um, you mentioned that if, if they were on your website, you know, let's change this to saw you were interested in data management um, or you could even try and come at it from a different angle saw we sorry, saw we are both interested in data management and i think i have something that will help right okay Okay, now look, okay, so we're both interested in data management, right? Obviously you're interested in it, you're working in this field, and so is that guy, they read about it on the website. And I think I have something that will help. Companies are grossing an influx of data and managing it all is difficult. Okay, who cares, right? I know this, they know this, it doesn't really help. Um, if you had them at a stage and you were talking through this, it, it would be okay, but you're gonna lose their attention um, in their inbox. So I would convert this to say, name a company, right? Company one and two, who you may recognize, um, are using this approach to save a ton of time each quarter or month or whatever it is that's relevant um, to your service offering. Maybe it's each day, right? Each day. Um, 
And then with all these products, all, building an in-house program seems like an easier thing to do, but at what cost? Um, again, I don't know, but I would assume that not everybody would agree with that statement. So let's change this up and just say, so company one and two, who you may recognize are using this approach to save a ton of time each day. Um, let me bring that back and I need to reread it. All right, so what I'm gonna do here, I just had to pause to think about this. I'm actually gonna merge these two sentences and there's cool data here, but it's it's not of interest to them as much as it is to, to you writing it about yourself. So I would change this to say, um, let's go straight to the solution, right? The matching engine is at the end. To make this about them, let's put it at the beginning. So, and I'm just gonna move this down so I can follow it. Uh, a matching engine is the solution that these companies and, and over 2,000 others have been using with, and this is where I'd insert my company name, um, since the early 90s. There's a flex, but it really is back in facts and it says, this is the solution, here's how awesome it is, right? And it's, it's about the solution for them rather than it's about you, but you're also the person that gives them the solution, not a competitor, because you've been doing it since the 2000s or since the 90s, over 2000 companies are doing it. And you already showed them a couple of names they recognize, you know, you're speaking their language up here in this first line. And if you can't name the companies for whatever reason, then you need to uh, do what's called a status tip off and get their attention a different way. You need to take this and say, hey, um, I'm going to use an industry term that's only known by the tradespeople in the in the field, right? Um, if it's you know if you're talking plumbing, you want to get people's attention to plumbing. Name it, name problems people have with homeowners losing things in the P trap or or whatever it may be, right? These are terms that everyday people don't understand. So if you can come out and talk about fishing, hairballs, and rings and jewelry out of P traps then it says, hey, this guy knows a little bit about plumbing. He knows a little bit about what I do each day. Um, so maybe it's relevant to me to keep reading this email. So now that we've said a matching engine, so we talked about the solution here, we can then simplify this email a whole lot. And time is an asset, and the reason I'm reaching out to you is to save more time. This is where I, I'm going to merge these two as well. What if we just put these two things together, right? They know time's an asset. This is not telling anybody anything new, but of course you do want to show them the value proposition and the value here is that they're going to get more time back through this problem solving solution. So I would say what's coming to mind here is um, time is an asset. Can I send you a data sheet that will, how about this, that has helped the other 2,000 companies save. And if you can be specific, do it X amount of time each day. You know, if you can be specific, do it. Um, a simple, sometimes I incentivize and you can test this, a simple yes is fine and I'll send it over, right? You want to make it super easy for them. Um, sometimes that doesn't work, but sometimes it's really helpful. Um, another approach you can take is the, um, the one, two, three kind of options. You could just say, you know, um, can I offer you one of, one of three things? One, you know, never talk to me again. This isn't relevant. Two, um, please send me over more information. If you've got a data sheet that would really help me out. And three, um, I, I think you've got the wrong person. I can forward you to the right person, right? And then just tell them, just reply with one, two, or three. Most people I reach out to fit one of those. And then people will reply back with numbers. Um, you can test that approach too. But I've skipped over talking about attention, interest, desire, and action, right? So the interest is right here. This is where we did the, this is the, status tip off um, and the credibility builder. And then the desire is showing them the light, the solution they need, right? Ideally. 
Um, and then the action is just the call to action and really, you know, make it easy and relevant. Um, if you're going to tie it in and ask for a call, if, if that's the way your process works, then say, you know, give them a reason to get on a call. Why do they want to get on a call so they can get pitched? Like nobody wants to do that. Maybe that's why I didn't have it in here in the first place. Um, there's no problem with asking for calls, but it needs to be a call to show you a solution, right? A call to give you free tools that you can implement. Even if you don't work with us, you can take value out of that call and you know, it'll be a good 30 minutes spent. Um, that's something that you can do. Also, if you want to bolster your desire and action section and the interest, all three of these, put in a no brainer offer. If you give a no brainer offer to people, um, here's an example of a no brainer offer. It would be something like, uh, Hey, we promise 15 leads over 90 days. And if you don't get 15 leads, we'll work for free right? Whoa. <laughs> okay, great. If you know that you can convert 15 to 20% of those leads and each one of those deals is worth $10,000 to you, then hey, as long as you and that company are agreed on what a lead looks like, that's a no-brainer offer, right? You're going to make a ton of money closing uh, those guys and they only want 5,000 bucks for the service. So yeah, I'm going to spend 5,000 bucks because I'm going to make 10 to 15. Uh, that's a no-brainer type of offer. And sometimes you have to work harder depending on your industry to come up with those. And sometimes you don't have the authority to do so, but they're great to bring up at meetings internally as well as something for people who do make those decisions to think about your organization to help you sell. Um, so I've rambled, gone through a whole lot here. And I like to incentivize instead of thank you or thanks, sometimes, you know, everybody's got their own personality, but I do talk soon if it's, if it's going to be a call or I'll do you know, looking forward to hearing from you. And then I'll do thanks, you know, Matt or, or something of that nature. Um, that's great. So we're 16, 17 minutes in. I want to keep this as short as possible. Let's talk about dual readership path right here, dual readership path. And this means you can read this email two ways. The first way is the way everybody thinks they're reading it. It's the way we went through this and edited it, right? We went through it and read it line for line. It's not how most people read an email. It's not how they decide to read an email. The way they decide is by scanning the email. And most people are not even most people. Statistically, we all take the path of least resistance, right? So if you can give them a path that's easy to follow in the copy, then they're going to read it. You're Body can't help but do the easy thing unless you force it not to. So let's say, hi, Matt. So we're both interested in data. Company one and two, who you may recognize are using. Okay. That's so, so here's what I've got so far, right? If I read both of these, saw so we are both. Okay, there's a mutual connection. This person believes there's a mutual connection. Um, if I'm really curious, I'll read further into this sentence. Otherwise, I'll keep going. Saw so we're both. Okay, he thinks there's a mutual connection. Let's find out if there is. Okay, McDonald's and Burger King, who you may recognize, yep, eat there every week. Great, cool. So now we're still bought in at this point. A matching engine is the solution. Huh, sweet, I've been waiting for somebody to bring me something like this, or it's not for them and they'll just stop reading right now, which is good too, right? Not everybody's your prospect. Um, so far, spot on. Let's say, oh man, that's awesome. You know, I need a, need a new whatever it is for my business, um, or I need this solution. Can I send you the data sheet that's helped over 2,000 companies? Absolutely. I'm not even reading the rest of this email. A simple yes is fine. I'll send it over. Yes, right? I'm going to reply back and make it easy. Now, this is all theory. You will have to test this, and you can totally take this and test it if it works for you. Um, but it may not work. This could flunk completely, and that's the funny thing about this theory and how it sounds good in the video. It may not convert, and you will have to pivot it and test it. Uh, because and I don't know if I said this at the beginning of this video or if it was my last one, um, but at the end of the day, the place that you came from when you sent this email and the way that it works is different than the place that, that, you know, that I am at standing here writing this for you right now is different from where you're sending it. So reiterate it, optimize it, test it, split test it, but consistency and, and doing this repeatedly will be what works and fall back to the ADA framework and the dual readership path, and you will get success. Don't get too bogged down in the call to action, and don't get too bogged down in your subject line. As long as you're getting, I would say, shoot, optimize for north of 40%, 40% or more is awesome, um, open rates, and then focus on that body. As long as you've got a reasonable call to action in there, 
that's great because at the end of the day, if the body is valuable in that email, they are going to reply anyway, even if the call to action is weak. So it's something that hedges in your direction, but it's not as important as the body in my personal opinion. Hope this is helpful. Let me know if you have more questions. Have a fantastic rest of your day.